In the ancient land of Mesopotamia, life unfolded in diverse ways, unlike the unified civilizations of ancient Rome or Greece. Mesopotamia was a tapestry woven with various ethnicities and kingdoms, each distinct in its own right, even during the reign of the Akkadian Empire led by Sargon of Akkad. While there was no singular civilization, the people across Mesopotamia, from the emergence of cities around 4500 BCE to the decline of Sumer in 1750 BCE, shared certain commonalities. A striking aspect of Mesopotamian culture was the profound value placed on the written word. The advent of writing, around 3600 to 3000 BCE, led scribes to meticulously document every facet of city life. This focus on record-keeping provides modern archaeologists and scholars with valuable insights into the daily lives and work of these ancient people. Thornton Wilder once remarked on the mystery surrounding Babylon, saying, Babylon once had two million people in it, and all we know about them is the names of the kings and some copies of wheat contracts and the sales of slaves, our town. While Wilder's words were fictional, there was indeed much more to Mesopotamian history than just the names of kings and slave transactions. We have gained a comprehensive understanding beyond those details. Cities in ancient Mesopotamia housed populations that fluctuated significantly. For instance, around 2300 BCE, Uruk boasted 50,000 inhabitants, while Mari to the north had 10,000, and Akkad had 36,000. These urban populations were structured into distinct social classes, a hierarchical organization mirrored in civilizations throughout history. These classes included the king and nobility, the priests and priestesses, the upper class, the lower class, and the slaves. The king, holding a unique connection with the gods, served as an intermediary between the divine and earthly realms. The success of the territory ruled by a king was believed to reflect the gods' favor, and the king's duty was to care for the people. Simultaneously, the high priest or priestess tended to the needs of the city's god. A great king, through territorial expansion and prosperity, sought to demonstrate the god's approval. The priesthood played a crucial role in ensuring the gods recognized the king's accomplishments and invoked blessings accordingly. In this intricate tapestry of society, life in ancient Mesopotamia unfolded, guided by the interactions between rulers, priests, and the divine. And also in the realm of Mesopotamia, Sargon of Akkad, despite facing persistent rebellions, ascended to legendary status through his triumphant military campaigns and the vastness of his empire. Whether individuals or communities harbored mixed feelings about Sargon's rule, his success suggested divine favor from the gods he served, particularly Inanna. The high priest or priestess, devoted solely to the city's god, undertook crucial rituals and played a pivotal role in the spiritual life of the community. In the temple complex of the ziggurat, lesser priests and priestesses oversaw sacred aspects of daily life, officiating at religious services. Endowed with literacy, they excelled in interpreting signs and omens and also functioned as healers. In the outer court of the temple, priestesses emerged as the first doctors and dentists in Mesopotamia. Among these revered priestesses, in Doanna, the daughter of Sargon of Akkad, stood out. Serving as the high priestess at Yor, in Doanna, the world's first author known by name, focused on managing the temple's affairs and overseeing ceremonies, distinct from the healing role of her fellow priestesses. The upper echelons of society comprised merchants with flourishing enterprises, scribes, private tutors, and esteemed military leaders, accountants, architects, astrologers, often doubling as priests, and shipwrights also found their place among the privileged class. Merchants who owned successful companies and didn't need to travel reveled in a life of leisure, enjoying the finest beer in the city with friends, attended by slaves. Scribes, occupying a prestigious position, served in the royal court, temples, and educational institutions. In Mesopotamian schools, writing was a pivotal discipline, and every teacher held the esteemed title of a scribe. However, this privilege was reserved for boys, as the prevailing belief persisted that women, despite nearly equal rights, lacked the intelligence to master literacy. This mindset endured even in the wake of Indiana's notable career, casting a shadow over the potential intellectual contributions of Mesopotamian women. And in Mesopotamian life, private tutors occupied a position of high esteem, generously compensated by affluent families to ensure their sons excelled in their studies. These tutors, often not affiliated with a temple-run school, were esteemed for their exceptional intelligence, virtue, and character. Their commitment to their students was wholehearted, and if fortunate enough to have a wealthy patron, 
they could enjoy a lifestyle comparable to their benefactors. In the complex societal hierarchy, the lower class comprised those essential to the functioning of cities and regions, farmers, artists, musicians, construction workers, and various skilled craftsmen. Among them were also bakers, basket makers, butchers, fishermen, and a diverse array of professionals ranging from cupbearers and brick makers to brewers, tavern owners, prostitutes, metallurgists, carpenters, and more. Interestingly, certain occupations like prostitutes, perfume makers, jewelry makers, and goldsmiths, under specific circumstances, could transcend into the upper class based on exceptional skills or favorable relationships with wealthy patrons or the king. However, the social ladder in Mesopotamia was not rigid, allowing individuals from the lower class to ascend through merit. A notable example is the energetic queen Kubaba, a former tavern keeper who ruled the town of Kish, highlighting the potential for social mobility. While women primarily occupied lower class roles, they showcased remarkable versatility, serving as the first brewers, tavern keepers, doctors and dentists in ancient Mesopotamia before these professions shifted predominantly to men. At the bottom of the social hierarchy were the slaves, whose status resulted from various circumstances such as war capture, self-sale to settle debts, punishment for crimes, kidnapping, or selling by family members. Contrary to common perceptions, slaves were a diverse group, undertaking roles beyond manual labor. They managed households, tutored children, tended to horses, served as accountants, skilled jewelry makers, and more. Diligent slaves could eventually buy their freedom, showcasing a pathway for social advancement. Homes in Mesopotamia reflected the social order, with the king and his court residing in grand palaces. Urban dwellings expanded outward from the central temple and its ziggurat. Priests, residing in the city center, occupied prime locations, while the wealthiest lived closest to the core. Construction materials varied. The ziggurat, temple, and palace were constructed with oven-baked bricks, painted vibrantly, while affluent homes used sun-dried bricks, and those of lesser means relied on reeds. Slaves typically resided in their masters' homes or nearby in reed houses. These structures, often misunderstood as huts, were well constructed. For instance, reed homes were built with marsh plants bundled and arched over holes in the ground, forming a robust structure. Alternatively, brick homes utilized clay mixed with straw, molded into bricks, and sun-dried. Despite being less durable, sun-dried bricks were the common choice for ordinary homes due to the cost and labor involved in making oven-baked bricks. Lighting within homes came from small lamps fueled by sesame seed oil and occasionally windows, though rare due to the scarcity of wood. The exteriors of brick homes were whitewashed, with a single exterior door framed in red to ward off evil spirits. Southern Iraqi homes aimed to shield occupants from the relentless heat, using windows sparingly. As seasons changed, the rainy period prompted the use of palm fronds or palm wood for heating homes. Mesopotamian homes were not merely shelters, they were designed to adapt to the ever-changing climate and offer respite in the face of challenging conditions. And, in Mesopotamian daily life, homes of varying classes were not just structures, they were sanctified spaces seeking the blessing of the brother gods Kapta and Mushtama before the commencement of any building project. Regardless of social standing, whether residing in affluent palaces or humble abodes, the architecture required divine favor. Completed constructions were celebrated with offerings to Arazu, the god of finished buildings, as a token of gratitude. However, structural integrity wasn't always guaranteed. Ancient houses, especially those made of sun-dried brick, faced the constant risk of collapse. The laws of Hammurabi explicitly outlined a builder's responsibility, stipulating severe consequences if a poorly constructed house resulted in the death of its inhabitants. Furnishing Mesopotamian homes mirrored contemporary practices. Chairs with legs, backs and arms, along with tables, beds and kitchenware adorned living spaces. Wealthier homes boasted intricately carved beds, crisscrossed with rope or reeds, adorned with mattresses stuffed with wool or goat hair, and adorned with linen sheets. Some even exhibited opulence, with beds overlaid with precious metals like gold, silver, or copper. Lower-class families, however, slept on woven straw or reed mats laid directly on the floor. Windows, albeit rare due to wood scarcity, provided light alongside small lamps fueled by sesame seed oil. The exteriors of brick homes were whitewashed, and houses typically featured a single exterior door, 
its frame painted red to ward off malevolent spirits. With an understanding of climate challenges, homes were adapted to provide shelter from the relentless heat of southern Iraq, utilizing windows sparingly. Palaces, temples, and wealthier homes enjoyed ornate braziers for heating, while the lower classes utilized shallow pits lined with hardened clay. Surprisingly, indoor plumbing existed by at least the 3rd millennium BCE, with toilets in upper-class homes, palaces, and temples connected to tiled drains that transported waste to cesspools or sewer systems. Family dynamics in ancient Mesopotamia closely resembled contemporary structures, encompassing mothers, fathers, children, and extended family. Both genders contributed to work, and children's roles were shaped by sex and social status. Male children of the upper class attended school, while their sisters learned domestic arts at home. Lower class sons followed their fathers into various professions, while daughters emulated their mother's roles. Children's play mirrored modern practices, with toys like slingshots, bows, arrows, dolls, and miniature furniture. Families engaged in board games, dice games, and sports, predominantly male-centric and including wrestling, boxing, and hunting for the nobility. The family meal, a familiar concept, differed mainly in entertainment forms during and after dinner. Storytelling and music were integral components of the evening, with wealthier families employing slaves or professional entertainers. Music, an essential aspect of Mesopotamian life, featured singers, percussion instruments, wind instruments, and stringed instruments like the lyre and harp. Inscribed plaques, carved seal stones, and sculpted reliefs bear testament to the Mesopotamians' profound love for music. It was not only an accompaniment to banquets and private meals, but also a vital element of daily life. Mesopotamians were depicted listening to music while drinking beer, reading, or relaxing in their homes or gardens. Music, like a vibrant thread woven into the fabric of daily existence, echoed through the corridors of Mesopotamian life, transcending time and resonating across the ages. And the people of ancient Mesopotamia prepared for their evening repast. The daily rhythm unfolded in a tapestry woven with barley, the chief grain crop, as they indulged in the elixir of Ninkasi, the goddess of beer. Her hymn, an ancient melody from around 1800 BCE, echoed the world's oldest beer recipe, a testament to the Mesopotamians' culinary ingenuity. Their diet, a symphony of flavors, extended beyond barley to include fruits, vegetables, fish from streams and rivers, and livestock like goats, pigs, and sheep. Hunting game, such as deer and gazelle, and domesticated geese and ducks complemented their culinary repertoire. With an impressive inventory of indigenous goods, flavored with oils and minerals, Mesopotamians celebrated a rich culinary heritage. Beer, highly valued and used to pay wages, often took center stage in the midday meal, a thick and nutritious concoction. Before indulging their appetites, gratitude resonated through prayers to gods who provided sustenance. Religion was woven into the fabric of daily life, a communion between humanity and the divine. The pantheon of Mesopotamian deities guided existence, reciprocating the labor of the people with divine blessings. The divine touch extended even to the clothes they wore. Reflecting social standing, clothing became a canvas painted with patterns that spoke of one's place in society. Wool and linen dominated Mesopotamia's textile landscape, with cotton and silk making later appearances. Men adorned long robes or pleated skirts, while women graced one-piece tunics of wool or linen. Soldiers, distinctive in their hooded capes, stood out in ancient depictions. Patterns and designs infused the robes of Mesopotamian women, adding a vibrant kaleidoscope to their attire. Embroidered shawls and hooded capes shielded them from the elements, highlighting their sense of style. Cosmetics, a timeless desire to enhance allure, graced both men and women. Eyes were outlined with an early form of mascara, while perfumes, steeped in aromatic plants and blended with oil, became treasured elixirs. The pursuit of beauty through cosmetics and perfumes, stretching back to Sumerian times, was a thread connecting the ancients to our modern preoccupations. In the tableau of daily life, family dynamics mirrored the present day. Men and women worked, children followed roles dictated by sex and status, and toys like dolls and miniature furniture echoed through the ages. Board games, dice games, and sports enlivened leisure moments, resonating with familiar echoes of contemporary pastimes. As the evening meal unfolded, storytelling and music accompanied the feast. Families gathered, much as they do today, to share moments of joy and stories. 
the rich tapestry of life in ancient Mesopotamia, woven with prayer, work, leisure, and family, resonates across time. Technological strides may suggest a vast chasm between us and our forebears, yet the archaeological records whisper a different truth. Human nature, with its desires and daily patterns, appears remarkably unchanged, bridging the millennia with a familiarity that transcends the ages.